Well, um, welcome everybody. Thank you again for joining our, uh, our series of um, Hype webinars. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you all again. And um, these, these topics are getting more and more uh, popular. We have um, many, many people from all around the world joining our webinar series. And it's a delight to be able to uh, share with you and uh, uh, talk with you about the sort of topics that we find uh, stimulating and engaging to our, to our clients around the world. Um, I know that uh, many of you are experienced hype uh, uh, advocates and uh, we, we hear, see you on each of our webinars, but many of you are new to us as well, so I'll just provide a brief introduction to myself and my role here at Hype. Um, I run our strategic consulting group, uh, which is the people and process part of our business. Um, we're the group of people who help with the elements to consider around uh, online innovation programs outside of um, the actual application itself and the, the, uh, the portals that we, we provide. And we spend our day jobs um, working with customers on the change management, the communications, coaching of, of uh, practitioners, and also uh, stakeholder support in actually developing sustainable online innovation management programs, often at an enterprise or multi-enterprise scale. Um, so we tend to think about things from a business problem perspective, from a cultural perspective, uh, from a structural perspective, as opposed to just about the application and the things that uh, the, the software software does well. So although you'll be aware we're an application company, primarily today we're going to be focusing on the, the people and process elements of, of establishing um, effective programs. Um, the topics, uh, for those of you who are new, we'll just do a few quick slides about hype, just so you have some context about the, the conversation we're going to have for the rest of the session. And I'm going to be walking you through three main topics that we find have a big bearing on the effective establishment of that first phase, that day one program. So what do we need to do? What do we need to care about? What things can we change and adapt which are going to stimulate better levels of engagement, more sustainable engagement, and higher quality submissions on that day one? We're going to talk specifically about your culture and the variety of things that come into play when it comes to team thinking about the, the tactics for your innovation activities, what kind of participation you want, where you want your participation to come from, what type of skill sets you have, what kind of demographic you have. All these things are going to affect how to establish that, that very first, uh, first step on the ladder. And if the, the culture gives us our, um, our current position and the goals give us where we want to get to, there's a bit in the middle, essentially the moving parts, the things that we can influence and affect that will um, be the, uh, the, the, the bulk of the conversation today. So what is it that we can do in order to primarily move our organizational culture forward, get it to share, to collaborate, to work together better? So let's talk a little bit about Hype and very briefly introduce the company. Um, those of you who know us will know our mission is, is to simplify innovation. Um, we're an innovation software company, so we provide platforms, but we also provide frameworks, guidances, processes to help enable our clients to actually innovate. And they, the programs that we support, um, the scale is, is very, very wide. So in some cases, we'll support very small programs with 20 or 30 people. In other cases, we'll support programs of 250,000 people or open innovation programs open to, to everybody in the world. Um, Hype's been in business for instance around um, 2001. Uh, we're actually spin off in, from Daimler in, in Germany. And our headquarters is still in, in Bonn in Germany. We run our US operation out of, uh, out of, bon, uh, out of Boston in, uh, in Massachusetts, and we also have other offices around uh, around Europe and the U.S. Um, we have a you know a very robust and effective innovation management um, application, a setup suite of applications that offer some off the shelf uh, off the shelf tools, but also very very configurable and flexible to support different types of companies that do have different types of requirements, um, and be them big multinational chemical companies or much smaller services companies. We hope we've had a solution that suits just about everybody. Um, so though if you, you look at us, you'll see we're a software company, we do some other things as well. Uh, we help on the integration side of making sure the IT elements are all uh, sound and effective, integrated into your environment and other applications that you care about. We, we also support organizations on the process side of things to making sure that we go all the way from engaging people on key strategic areas of innovation, the sort of topics and the focus areas, the hunting grounds if you like, all the way through to implementation. So taking you through those steps of, of ideating, sharing, collaborating, assessing the content that you've received, also developing some of that content into business cases and eventually to, to innovation projects. And my world, my part of the, the business is the strategic consulting the group, as I mentioned before, the, the people in the process elements that look at everything from holding the hands of practitioners that are establishing new enterprise programs all the way through to the strategic alignment and making sure 
the innovation investments that we put in place are aligned and effective and going to take our company towards its, its uh, wider innovation goals. Um, you are all part of the, uh, the Hype family, the Hype community, and there's some perhaps closer, closer members of that family than others, but um, part of this uh, innovation uh, webinar series that we run is to, is to build relationships and to, to increase the amount of conversation around uh, innovation and the sort of challenges that, that enterprises face when it comes to engaging their, uh, their employees, their partners, their suppliers in the, in the topic of innovation in terms of, in terms of generating new content and developing better and, and richer business concepts that can help uh, complement the organization's growth. So there's a whole range of different ways you can get in touch with Hype. You can read our innovation blog where we have uh, thought leaders from industry but also um, Hype employees as well talking about the sorts of things that we see day to day as, as people operating in the innovation world. Um, you can go and read our articles on places like Innovation Excellence or InnovationManagement.se around the sort of things that we, we see come up in, the, in terms of practitioners and innovation stakeholders. Um, Mitch mentioned our forums that um, uh, we, we have coming up and, and certainly I'll be hosting uh, the Las Vegas forum in October so any uh, US or companies with people in the US that would like to attend that please feel free to get in touch and, and to register to that. Um, and these are all things that we do um, essentially at no charge. So we, we try to invest uh, our time and energy to help educate um, organizations interested in this space and, um, and hope we can be of benefit uh, to the, the wider innovation initiatives that we all uh, are so, uh, so passionate about. So that's enough about hype. Um, let's move on to goals and topics. And you know, a lot of organizations will start off on these programs and they'll think, well, let's just try it out. Let's just try and get the organization involved. Let's see how we go. Let's see whether people were prepared to join in. And actually, that's kind of the wrong way to think about it. Uh, employees in general have very, very short amounts of time to do things that are beyond the realms of the normal day job. We're competing for their time. And so what we find is a much more constructive way to go about establishing an enterprise program is to think about it from a strategic goal perspective and then work our way back. So what are we trying to achieve as an organization? What types of innovation and activities are going to contribute to that goals? And then what things do we need to do to actually get us on that path? Now, we can moderate our ambition in terms of scale or adventure, but just trying it out, just seeing if people will come will, find, will typically be disappointed. We need to give them things that are real to get engaged with. If we can focus on real things that the organization absolutely needs to address, we're much more likely to get some, some people joining in and, and, and some passion. So let's think about the goals first. And the goals are essentially where, where we're aiming for. That's kind of obvious. Um, there are things that we can change and adapt to to, uh, to help meet those goals. And there's our cultural baseline, essentially where we are today. Um, yes, we'd all love to have a culture that is very dynamic, very enthusiastic for innovation, passionate to get involved. But often, the, there are some challenges there. Maybe people don't share as much as we'd like. Maybe they don't collaborate well. Maybe they protect innovate, information and are not quite so open with, with their knowledge and their expertise as we would like. That's real life, and we have to think about where we are today. We have to think about our demographic, our cultural mix, the countries that we're exposed to, because they, unless we address those things, unless we take them into account, we will struggle to get um, the maximum benefit from our, uh, from our, uh, our enterprise. But once we know where we are at, once we know what kind of culture we have, we've got a bit of a sense of, of what kind of dynamics are going on in our company. There are some things that we can do to adapt to that to help still take us on to our, our goals. And what we hope is this becomes actually more of an iterative process so that once we achieve a goal, we communicate that back to the organization. The organization gets a bit more passionate, a bit more enthusiastic about getting involved in innovation and collaborating and sharing. And then we begin to move the culture forward. So this becomes more of a loop. Right now we have it presented as a straight line for the purposes of argument, but hopefully we begin to see we can start on this path. So the moving parts that I want you to think about as we go through today, and we're going to be dealing with this in the second part of the webinar, are the positioning of the innovation program that we put in place. What do we call it? How do we present it to the organization? How do we position it in terms of other things that we do and things that have gone before? Are we building upon a history of successful collaborative innovation across the organization? Is this something that's completely new to the company? Are we only ever going to be thinking about innovating products and services? Or are we also going to be thinking about innovating our business model and our processes? All of these things will come into play. So how we position our innovation program will affect how people see it and whether they engage or not. So that's one of the areas we need to think about.
The second piece is the communications part, raising awareness, marketing the program. This is the run up to day one. How do we communicate that this is new? How do we communicate what it is, how we want people to join in, what we'd like people to do in terms of uh, participation? What channels do we use? What kind of, uh, do we go top down, do we go bottom up? Do we try and create a viral enthusiasm for the approach? Um, again, we want to think about how we're going to communicate this once we've got that positioning sorted out. Now we can position it perfectly, we can raise awareness, we can put lots of energy into our communication strategy, but if we don't have a good topic for people to engage with, a good innovation topic, a good focus, and sponsors that can foster belief and confidence around that process, then we're going to struggle to get people to join in. And that's the sort of heart of what we're trying to do here, is to create an enthusiasm and an energy around getting involved in innovation. And the sponsors that we choose, the people that we use to stimulate our innovation topics and to pose those directed innovation challenges and the topics that they ask are going to, are going to have a big bearing. And finally, what can we do before we even start to build belief and confidence in the process? Now, we'll get better at this as we progress, but on day one, actually, there's quite a lot we can do. And we can address what sort of things we might want to change, how we might want to foster, what kind of messages we might want to put out there to make sure we can build belief. So I'd like you to sort of maintain these, these four areas in your minds for the time being, and we're going to deal with the culture first, but then we're going to come back to these four areas a little bit later on, once we've had a thought, thought about what kind of effect the culture has. So let's go back to our goals. Um, and I think it's worth asking the question, why do organizations implement enterprise innovation programs anyway? You know, as soon as we go to the enterprise, it typically means online. It typically means getting a large group of people involved. This is becoming more and more popular, particularly within the developed, uh, developed world. Um, and these are the three areas that we see companies typically will, will talk to us about. Right? I'd like to just sort of make sure we're all on the same page here. Yes, we want to drive more innovation. Yes, we want to potentially reduce costs. And in many cases, we also want to improve our uh, employee engagement. And those three things are usually linked to, um, to three others, which is we're looking for growth, we're looking to improve our profitability, value to shareholders, um, we want to increase the amount of flexibility we have as a business and make sure we have more cash, or we want to gain more from our resources. So the things on the right-hand side are typically the things that keep the C-suite awake at night, and things on the left-hand side are the activities that we'll typically do to, in order to, to help contribute to that. But bearing these things in mind, growth, profitability, and, and getting more from our resources is, is worth um, just, just paying attention to before we start, we start moving forward. These are the really dri real driving factors, not innovation. You know, innovation is not a means to an end in itself, it's to support these other areas. So let's think about an early stage program, bearing in mind what kind of objectives we have. And an early stage program, so this is what we would like to have in place on day one, is usually a combination of things. We normally start off with an area of strategic focus. So this is an area that we want people to think about as a macro level topic that we're trying to focus on, trying to address. This could be a big picture um, a strategic innovation area. It could be uh, an area of cost reduction. It could be a process that we're, we're struggling with. It could be a, a trend that we're seeing out there in the market. It could be a whole range of things. But it's a macro um, uh, combination of different innovation activities. And underpinning that, we may well have a set of idea campaigns in our hopper ready to go. We normally start off with one at a time, but there's probably a range of different topics that are going to contribute to that area of strategic focus. Now, wrapping around all of that will be communications. So how do we communicate the things that we're trying to do at a program level? Well, then how do we communicate uh, initiatives at a campaign level. Now, we're not going to go into vast details in terms of communicating individual campaigns today. We're going to focus more on the program. But in terms of, just bear that in mind, each campaign, each directed innovation activity actually needs its own attention on communications and activities. And then we need some high-level support. So usually someone in the C-suite who says, we as an organization are looking for more innovation. It's important that we invest in innovation. These are the goals and the objectives of the company. I'd like you to join in. Essentially giving people some confidence that the organization is taking this seriously and it actually wants people to get involved and start sharing and collaborating. Now, middle management may still be a challenge, but at least if we have the top level of the organization offering some, some reassurance that this is where the company is heading and this is why we want you to pay attention to innovation, we're beginning to, beginning to set the right kind of tone for the, for the program. And that, of course, will help foster that belief to a certain extent later on that we talked about already. 
In terms of goals for the first phase for day one, then we typically fall into these sort of categories. So companies will say, well, we want people to engage, we want people to participate, we want them to share. And engagement, of course, is important because unless people join in, we're not going to generate the ideas and the innovations and the concepts that we really care about in order to actually complement to those objectives that we talked about a moment ago. But sharing, of course, is important. Even if people are logging in, joining in, are they actually sharing? Are they collaborating with each other? Sharing isn't actually enough. We need people to build and improve and develop the ideas of other people to develop more rounded concepts and allow the community to steer us towards the sorts of things that are likely to be feasible, viable, and can be put into practice. But again, we don't want a thousand ideas that are poor. What we want is good quality commit submissions. I'd much rather have 10 great ideas than a thousand poor ones. So we want a good quality benchmark. We want people to be offering us things that are useful, that are relevant, that are appropriate to the type of challenges that we face as an organization. And with any luck, what we hope for, of course, is some quick wins. And quick wins are vital because if we can generate some quick wins from our initial phase of campaigns, we can communicate that back to the organization. We can show progress. We can show success. And what that will do is then, again, in this, this iterative cycle, boost engagement. More people will share. More people will co collaborate. And then once we've got a greater diversity of opinion, we should get greater quality of submissions, and so the loop goes on again. So we need to make sure that whatever we focus on in that very first phase is something that will feasibly give us something to shout about at the end of it. So we talked a little bit about idea campaigns on and off, and I want to just address, for those of you who aren't so aware, what they are, how they manifest themselves and what they are. We won't spend too long on this, because I know that many of you are very familiar. But there is a tactical sponsorship to an idea campaign. So somebody with a need, it could be a growth objective, it could be a cost saving uh, need, it could be a problem. But somebody with a need, someone who's going to give the process uh, credibility. This is someone who's prepared to stand up and say, I have a challenge or an opportunity or a problem and I'd like your help in order to solve that. Campaigns are typically run over a relatively short period of time, somewhere between two to three days to two to three weeks, depending on the, uh, the, the program, depending on the culture, uh, depending on the, the workforce that we have. But they're time limited, and there is a deadline. And this deadline is very important. It actually drives engagement. It helps make sure that we get people coming in at the right time and we're sharing everything they have within a manageable, feasible period of time. We don't just send every campaign to everybody. We try to be careful with regard to our audience. That doesn't mean necessarily excluding people, but in terms of proactively inviting individuals, we choose an appropriate audience for our campaigns. So we choose the people that we think can feasibly answer the question or can at least understand that. And that's a balancing act, because we don't always know where the great insights and knowledge and, and expertise is. So we need to be relatively considered in how we go about that. We want Typically, in the early stage process, to go a little wider, make sure we get a diversity of opinion, which we know is so crucial to developing new and, and interesting ideas, but not so wide that we bombard every person with lots of irrelevant questions that they can't feasibly address. And finally, we will typically share with the audience some degree of selection criteria. This is our quality lever. Um, this will tell the organization that we want ideas that can be feasibly implemented within six months or cost them a million dollars to put into practice or have a 10x ROI. This gives people a bit of an idea of what kind of box we want them to sit within. And we do need to create within a box because otherwise the diversity of content we get will be far too wide and often implementation rates for big open suggestion boxes aren't, aren't so good. And of course, this process is, is relatively mature. I mean, it's been, been used for many, many years now and applied to lots of different things. We tend to think about it in terms of generating new ideas for new products or new services. But in many cases, it's just as applicable to identifying best practices, um, finding uh, risks and mitigating them, identifying new thinking. Um, obviously, cost reduction is a big popular area for a lot of companies as well. So um, this, this technique is simply the best way of getting a large, diverse group of people in a virtual room in a with a manageable process that allows them to share and collaborate. So we thought about the goals. We thought about the steps we were going to go through. We thought about what kind of outcomes we're looking for in terms of engagement or idea quality, participation, what kind of behaviors we want to see in terms of people sharing and collaborating. Um, let's go back a couple of steps and let's think about where we are today. So we have clear in our mind our, our objectives, both in the long and short term. We need to then think about what's feasible and possible within our position today. What will our culture actually allow us to do? And the reason we raise this is that if you have a misalignment between the culture that you have 
and the innovation topics that you go after, the result is people don't join in. And I'll give you an example. Suppose you are a power company and you are typically make your money from power generation, power stations. Innovation in your world in terms of the product is probably somewhere between a 20 to 30 year process. You know, building a new power station perhaps, developing new sources of energy, it's a long journey. Now if your demographic, which is just one element of the culture, is relatively old, relatively close to retirement, then asking them questions about big, radical, 30-year innovation programs is going to be a struggle for them to care. They will be retired by the time those innovations come to fruition. So we need to think about what types of innovation, what types of topics are going to be appropriate to our culture. Otherwise, we have that mismatch. The result will be people don't join in. I want to talk about four different areas of culture, but let's first give ourselves a bit of a benchmark, a bit of a baseline to think about what we really mean in practice, because culture is one of those words, unfortunately, a little bit like innovation, that's banded around a lot, and we always ask customers, what do you mean when you say we want to have an improvement in our culture, or greater levels of innovation in our culture, what does that actually mean? And the definition, if you go and look up culture, it reads like this, it's, it's the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. Now that's quite a grand statement. I think it's worth breaking that down and thinking about what does that mean in practice when it comes to enterprise innovation programs. And really what it comes down to is how do people behave? What do they do? What is it in terms of their geography, their demographic, their skill set, their expertise, the type of work that they do which affects the type of behaviors that we see? Now, if those of you that work for multinationals will see quite significant cultural differences between different countries. Um, you know, I'm a Brit and I'm working for a German company, and although cultures are relatively similar, there are still some significant differences in the way pe which people work, the way which people share, and the way, that, way, way those two cultures operate. Um, if I compare perhaps a British culture to American culture, again, we'll see some differences. But geography is only one aspect of culture. So think about, as of today, do people collaborate well? Do they share information when asked? Do they trust and engage with management decisions? When management says, hey, everybody, we'd like you to do this, this is a new initiative, do people respond to that well? Or do they think, oh, it's just the latest new thing and, and kind of zone out? Do people really believe in what the company is trying to achieve? And this may well be affected by your geography, but it may also be affected by history. So if the organization has a history of, of letting people down or perhaps um, running a lot of initiatives, then maybe these things are a challenge. But let's think about and be very honest with ourselves about whether people collaborate, share well, and to what level of trust and engagement they have with management. Being honest with yourself about these things will only ever pay dividends. Um, there's no point hiding away and wishing we had a better culture. We have what we have, and hopefully if we can recognize that and be constructive in how those, those moving parts we'll talk about later, we can maybe also begin to improve that a little bit. So let's think about four different elements of the culture. Um, one is skill set. Are people knowledge workers or not? Um, do we have a combination of knowledge workers and blue-collar workers? What level of academic achievements exist within the company? And what type of work are people doing? Um, if you have an, an organization that has everybody's at degree level, everybody's relatively academic, the type of questions you may ask may be much more detailed and focused on, uh, on the nuances of the business that you have than perhaps if, if people have a lower standard of, of academic achievement or that perhaps uh, we're not employing those kind of, kind of individuals. The type of questions we can feasibly ask someone in a, a chemicals company will be very different to someone in a services company. So be cognizant of what type of, of individuals we employ, be respectful of that and, and think about what's appropriate. What could they feasibly address, what could they feasibly engage with? Think about what type of work they're doing. Think about how they interact with others and, and begin to get, 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 build yourself a picture of what sort of topics we may wish to address to which types of groups. Another element of culture is, of course, the demographics. You know, how old are we? What kind of cultures do we have employed? Um, you, know, you can look at average employees, sure, but probably be a little bit smarter than that. Think about, you know, do we have a lot of baby boomers that are about to retire? they may well have a different dynamic than the thousand new graduates that we just hired uh, last year. The way that um, people of an older generation is likely to be different to the way people of a younger generation behave. And there is no good or bad. We just need to adapt. So we may find that, yes, our new graduates are great in terms of engaging in more radical, more interesting, more, more innovative, creative, longer-term topics, but aren't so good in terms of helping us innovate our processes 
aren't so good about helping us reduce our costs as they have less experience in those things. So again, this is where this alignment between culture and topics really, really comes to the fore. Consider your company structure. Are you hierarchical? Where are the largest groups of employees? Are you all employed in the same location or are you spread across multiple different locations? Do you have a very flat organization or is it, is it, is it, is it much many, many more stages of management between the top and the bottom? Those things will have an, have an effect. Um, if you have a big bulk of employees in, in uh, continental Europe and you have a big bulk of employees in, in Asia, you'll see differences in the way in which decisions are made, the way in which people are involved in those decisions. And again, be honest with yourself. Think about how people interact. Do they actually interact with different divisions? Um, do people with common skill sets actually pursue other people and, and share with other people that are perhaps operating different divisions but equally with, with, with common skill sets and interests? Again, try and be honest with yourself. Do these divisions actually talk to each other or not? Or do they essentially operate at silos? In order to get anything done, do we have to go through three levels of management or is decision making really relatively well devolved? If we have lots of separate P&Ls, that, that will affect how um, investment decisions will be made. It will affect how people, people's belief and confidence in some of those questions that are asked. You know, do I feasibly believe that the sponsor that's asking me this question can actually go and make that change, can, can, can influence the company, company direction strategy? And the final part, and the one that we typically think about when we think about culture is geography, which of course is only one element of, of, of the culture, and I think there are, there are other aspects we're not even touching on here. You know, countries that you operate in will have an effect in the level of respect and trust you have in management. It'll also affect the level of enthusiasm you show in getting involved in innovation. We work with a lot of companies that have operations perhaps in the US and also in India. And there's a big difference in, in the participation dynamic. We'll typically drive more content, more ideas, more concepts out of our Indian colleagues than we will out of our American colleagues. But perhaps the quality won't not be quite so high. So that's going to affect how we ask our questions. Maybe we want to be more precise to people from the subcontinent, a little bit more open to people from North America to make sure we have a good balance of quality and participation. Now, of course, in many cases, we don't have that luxury. We need to ask those cultures the same kind of question. But bearing this in mind, it will affect how people join in. Um, think about each region. Does it do as it's told? Does it set its own agenda? Again, you know, what level of command and control actually exists between these different countries? Um, you certainly will see significant differences in how people collaborate, how they share, what kind of information they're prepared to share, whether they make time for you when you need it um, between different geographies. There's not a lot you can do about these, some of these things, but we can bear that in mind and we can adapt when, when, we, when, when possible. Now, if those of you who are particularly interested in this, this country dynamic, and I'd recommend taking a read of the Gert, Gert Hofstadter report, which actually explains different countries and the sort of uh, pre, the, the, the uh, predispositions that people from those countries are more likely to have in terms of you know, things like respecting of hierarchy and you know, how they work together. So we talked a little bit about culture. We talked about four different elements of culture in terms of skill sets, demographics, company structure, and geography. And the question you may be asking is, okay, that's great, but what do we actually do about that? What, that, that gives us our current position, but how do we react to that? What's that going to mean in practice? Well, we're going to move on to that in a second, but in principle, at a high level, skill sets are going to affect the level of information we provide to people and the topics that we, we ask them to engage with. So we have a very relatively academic community. We may provide much more detailed, much more information-based questions than, than, than another alternative. Our demographics, that may well affect the appetite for innovation. It may affect whether innovation is actually the terminology we want to use at all, and we'll, we'll touch on that in, in more in a second. Again, it may well affect the topics that we go after in terms of how far ahead is innovation in our world. You know, do we work for a pharmaceutical company where it may take us 13 to 15 years to build, take a new drug to market, or do we work for a you know, media company where perhaps we can turn out a new product in six months? This is going to affect the demographic of the employees that you employ often. It's also going to affect the appetite for getting involved in innovation and what innovation really means in, in, in those people's minds. Company structure. The tactics and rollout strategy are going to affect you know, how many countries are you in? Are you in one place or multiple places? Can you communicate with everybody? You know, are you based across four or five main locations or are you spread across 300 locations? That's going to affect your communications. It's going to affect what's feasible in terms of getting the message out there and what you can realistically do. And again, that may well affect who you invite to which campaigns and, and when. And finally, geography. That's also going to affect 
those tactics and that rollout strategy in terms of that diversity of locations that we have and the cultural mix that, we, that we're exposed to. Now, we don't just get too wrapped up in that. I want to try and make some of this very, very practical. And so the next section we talk about is going to be about these moving parts that we can affect and adapt um, to make sure that we are bearing in mind our culture, bearing in mind our goals, and making sensible decisions in terms of adapting to those things to make sure that that first phase is as effective and efficient as possible. As we move into the fourth section of this webinar, feel free to start submitting any questions that you have in the little questions box, anything that comes up. Um, as, as Mitch said, we'll try and address as, as many questions as we can um, at the end of the session, whatever we have time for. And uh, if we don't have time for your questions, we will come back to you at a, at a later stage. So the moving parts. These are things, and I often think about it like a gearbox. It's a series of interlocking gears that we really want to, to, to try and have working in harmony together. And if we've got all the gears and the right ratios, the right meshes, then we're going to have the car moving forward nicely and smoothly in an effective and efficient way. Um, but if we get one of these things wrong, it's going to affect all of the others. So the first one is sponsors and topics that engage people. Um, we need to think about what type of questions we're going to ask the organization on day one. What sort of sponsors are we going to have connected to those questions? We need to think about whether those sorts of sponsors and questions are going to be stimulating for the type of culture and audience that we have. We need to think about what we can do before we even start to help build belief and confidence in the process. Now, of course, not everybody's going to join in on day one. It may take as many years to get as breadth of, of engagement that we're, we're really looking for. Rigorous reinforcement of, of building belief and confidence in this process is going to be important. But there are quite a lot of things that we can do before we even get started to make sure that the sort of common pitfalls, the common things that people may fear, we try and avoid them getting in the way as far as, as, far as possible. When you think about communications, how do we get the message out there? What kind of channels are we going to use? What kind of material might we use? What's appropriate for our culture? What's appropriate for the organization? And we'll talk more about that and show you some examples from our, from our customers a little later. Then positioning. So what do we actually call this? How do we get people involved? We talk about innovation, but we need to bear in mind as innovation professionals that innovation is a buzzword. And for many people, it actually switches them off. So we need to think about how we present this, this kind of program to people and how we, uh, how we position it. And often that's dictated by the sort of topics that we go after. So let's trail with that topic first, positioning. For many companies, it's pretty obvious that the reason that they employ um, organizations like Hype or, or other organizations to help them improve their growth levels and their cost, um, cost levels is because innovation is important. And they brand and position their enterprise innovation programs as such. But for other companies, what they think is, well, innovation is a bit of a buzzword, and actually there's lots of different things in our businesses that we want to, that we want to improve. It's not just perhaps where people perceive innovation, We're not just necessarily thinking about uh, products, we're not necessarily just thinking about service. We want to think about everything in our business. And so we may position that program a little bit more differently. We may emphasize things like collaboration. We may emphasize things like teamwork and sharing. And so the way they position their enterprise innovation program is one of, helping support the strategic goals in the company, and this is the place to connect, this is the place to share, this is the place to help us out. And actually innovation in its most traditional form will be one of a number of things that we're going to care about and focus on. And what they recognize is this world does not get everybody excited. Yes, as innovation professionals, our, our ears prick up and this does capture our attention when we see it. And sometimes that's a cynical look at a poster or at a company that's sort of banging on in about innovation and we know actually they're, they're not so, so innovative under the skin. And sometimes it's just because we see it in every news article and it just becomes you know, almost so watered down. Well, let's go back to those fundamentals that we talked about earlier. Growth, profit, employee engagement, these are the reasons why we innovate. And so sometimes positioning our programs, our enterprise programs, as being the place for innovation is something we can get away without, without doing. Raising awareness. Um, we tend to think about communications in top-down or uh, bottom-up, and often a combination of the two is, is the way to go. You know, how much do we shout from the parapet and how much do we, do we whisper? Um, how much do we try and engineer the organization to, to share and co collaborate and, and build upon this topic themselves? And of course, there's a balance to be struck. And in many cases on day one, we tend to emphasize the first one. We tend to shout a little bit louder. 
Now, some organizations will go for a relatively modest rollout plan and they'll, they'll go with not shouting too loudly, but you do need to make people aware. We do need to make sure that people have um, uh, some knowledge of how to get involved and understand the importance of getting involved in innovation. As we mature, we'll typically transition to more of a whispering approach. We'll typically establish advocate communities to share, um, the, the share the message of innovation from the bottom up. And there are various different things that we can do to, to influence that, that. The next webinar we talk about, we'll go into much more detail about advocate communities. So, and the things to think about in terms of, of your tactics are, is your organization one of command and control? If it is, is that as a technique, as a, as a tactic, actually respected? Does it work? Does it work within some cultures but not others? Because if it works well, then we can complement that. If, if, if you know, being told by your boss that you should go and do this is the way that things work, and in some cultures it is, then we may as well add that to the portfolio and we add that to the process. But if people are cynical of that approach, if people don't like that approach, we need to look at something different. Maybe we do something softer, maybe we run webinars, maybe we run briefing sessions or town hall meetings or things that are a little bit gentler than simply your boss telling you to go and do something. Is your organization highly fragmented? Lots of different people in lots of different places. Again, that's going to affect how we get the message out there. Maybe town hall meetings are not really a tactic that we can, we can use. Maybe putting things on people's desks is going to, there's too many people in too many different places to make that possible. Maybe we need to lean on uh, perhaps local meetings and, and use middle management to get the message out there. Or maybe we need to run more online sessions and allow people to come and go as they please uh, to get people aware and, and supportive of the process. You're asking whether people really understand their role in the program. And, and many companies are now saying, well, as employees of this company, to survive and grow, your role is to be complementing and contributing to the innovation process. So we need to make people aware of this. The trust that people have in management decisions is going to affect it as well. So if we have a great process, we communicate well, but hey, actually the sponsors that we picked in terms of the initial campaigns are not well respected. They're not considered to be doers and people that can really put things into practice, and that's going to affect how people believe in the trust they have in the process overall. If this is perceived to be just one of a many number of initiatives that are out there, maybe it gets lost in the foray. So if, if there's lots of stuff happening, that doesn't necessarily mean you don't run enterprise innovation programs. What it means is you may need to position it differently. Look at the channels that people are using to get those messages out there. Is everything done through the corporate internet? Let's be different. Let's look at different techniques to get the message out there. Let's look at different channels, different messaging that's going to make this feel different. So in terms of raising awareness, this is the, the area that we tend to think about, the sort of pre-briefing phase, the bit before we actually launch formally and actually brief on the particular topic that we're engaging. And this is a sort of weekly, weekly program that you, you may have some of you may be familiar with. Um, think about what, what kind of messages, what kind of channels, what kind of approaches will get the message out there. We have all kinds of different things shared from our, from our customers, and I'd like to share with you a couple of examples that were shared uh, publicly in our, our last um, Hype client forum in Bonn earlier in the year um, from both uh, from LGI and from Velo. And these are just some examples of the things to get you thinking. Some companies will invest heavily in a brand. They'll issue flyers. They'll put posters up there. They'll have um, uh, PCs and corridors for people to actually use and engage and, and have people stood by them to get them encouraged and enthusiastic and, and used to using um, enterprise innovation tools. And I think this is a good way of, of, of positioning it differently to everything else that's going on, creating a good, solid brand. Now, of course, this works when if you're going big bang, if you're going quite enterprise-wide quite quickly, if you're going much more modest, then maybe we need to think about an alternative. But this is the sort of stuff that the companies are doing. Um, an alternative here is from, from Liberty Global International, a media company. They went really big. They had uh, announcement dinner shows. They did posters. They developed innovation clubs and even put uh, innovation food on the menu called it brain food. I think that's really interesting. Again, it has its own brand. I think the point here in both of these examples is in neither case did they really use innovation in their brand. They focused it on, in this case, Spark, in the, this place giving your innovation wings. Innovation wasn't necessarily the message. It was, it was, a, it was a complementary part to it. And I think that's quite interesting to major corporations not necessarily pushing the innovation process too, too hard. 
This is something that we're doing with some customers as well, is developing innovation playing cards, things that we can drop on people's desks, people that sit there all the time, that people will just play with and play around with. It's a really good thing to have on your desk when you launch, um, actually showing what sort of and the things that we want people to do, how to get involved, what sort of behaviors we want to see, what it means to be part of an innovation process. Quite a good way, again, of getting that message out there. And it creates a conversation, a buzz, and a quite fun way of getting the, the, the message to uh, all kinds of corners of your organization. So let's take a slight sidestep, and let's think about sponsors and topics. Um, think about what people care about. Now, we may have big, adventurous, aggressive aims in terms of developing good innovation programs. But on day one, we may have to be much more moderate in terms of our ambition. Remember, we want the quick win. So think about what people care about day to day. What problems do they have? What solutions could we possibly offer that may well, uh, they may be enthusiastic about? If they're struggling with the profitability of a particular product line, um, and that's a big pain point for 100 people, then you know, it makes sense to run a campaign with those people and perhaps others around the organization to see if we can solve that problem. That's going to get middle managers excited and enthusiastic about the process, even though it may not necessarily be traditional focused around um, the sort of big innovation topics we, we care about. Think about how people are measured. And in many cases, individual employees are not measured on innovation type measures. They're not measured on you know, what type of innovations they generate. That may well change in the future, but as of today, it's probably not in place. Again, consider the demographic, what sort of topics are going to engage those people. And we may need to be pr more pragmatic on day one. If our culture is a little bit older, if people are measured on very tactical things, we need to be a bit more conservative in terms of our, of our innovation topics. This is where we can begin to start thinking about that culture, thinking about those different elements, and picking the sort of topics that are going to give us some safety, some, some, some comfort on day one. It doesn't have to be a big adventurous innovation target. Building belief. It's important that the employees, as far as possible on day one, have some messages out there that show them this matters, that actually they can believe in this process, we will execute. And this can obviously be affected by historical factors. So if they've been let down before, perhaps they've seen suggestion boxes and other innovation activities, attended brainstorming sessions maybe, and nothing really came out of it, um, then those sorts of things will have an effect. And we may not be able to address all of them. But trying to put some messages out there about credibility, having a senior corporate sponsor, sponsor program, having an, an, an exemplar tactical campaign sponsor that has credibility within organizations going to execute, that will help. Explaining how we're going to execute. If you generate these ideas, if we turn them into concepts, what are we going to do with them? How are they going to help us? What's that next step process going to be like? If we can explain those things in our writing of our campaign questions in terms of the messaging that goes alongside any kind of campaign, that's going to help reduce many of the barriers that people may be concerned about, who may block them from joining in. And I want to pick out this bottom one around moderation. One of the ways that we can encourage people to build, have more belief is to make sure that once they start engaging, we actually actively moderate. So we invite people, of course, to, to comment on ideas. So we actually share them. So many companies now are establishing moderation teams, people called lead innovators, who are logging in almost every day, adding comments, clarifying questions, asking people to come back, sharing ideas that have been submitted in the online platforms with other colleagues around the world, to say, hey, what do you think about this? This is of interest. I think this is relevant to your, to your skill set or your, or your objectives, or maybe you have the similar challenge. What do you think about it? It's more of a sort of bottom-up, more of a viral approach to getting more and more enthusiasm to people joining in than just being, say, hey, come and get involved. And refocusing the question, pulling experts into that process, again, in terms of belief and confidence, if you can see there's a set of lead innovators who are really stimulating this discussion, who are really getting involved, you can see that the ideas that you've submitted are getting some comments and some, some, some responses, that's going to make you feel more confident to join in yourself. If you're cautious, maybe you're not quite ready to join in, but you log in and you see there's a dynamic, active community of people really having a discussion. This isn't just a place for, you know, for geeks, this is just a place for people who have a particular passion for a topic. It's, an individual, it's, it's, it's for everybody. Again, the chances of you joining in are much, much higher. Everybody wants to be part of something successful, no one wants to be part of something that fails. So if you actually engineer the appearance of success, the appearance of dynamic community, that's going to then propagate. You know, develop better and better levels of engagement. 
So just to summarize before we move on to some, uh, some, some time for some questions, um, we talked about goals first. Think about what you're trying to achieve before you think about anything else. Think about what the longer term ambitions and goals are for the company and then moderate that down to some reasonable and pragmatic goals for the initial phase of your campaign. You know, if in doubt, go more tactical. You can always accelerate and get more adventurous later on, but you've got to build yourself a community that believes in you, that has some enthusiasm for the process and understands the value of the approach and, and how to get involved. So going too adventurous too soon can be, can be a dangerous thing. The other thing to bear in mind is when we talk about innovation, for some companies that's going to take a long time. So we've set ourselves targets that are way out there. It doesn't really give us the opportunity to show progress and success. Unless we can show progress and success, we may struggle to keep people engaged when they're not going to see any benefits for three, four, five, ten years. So we can have a mixture of innovation topics as we progress. Some stuff that's short term, some stuff that's longer term. It always makes sure we've got some success stories to keep going back to people whilst the stuff that happens and takes longer to achieve our benefits actually comes to fruition. So think about your goals and then take a step back and think about what's, what's, what's appropriate for your particular culture. And don't just think about geographies, think about skill sets, think about demographics, think about what people actually do as part of their job, what kind of roles they have, think about their level of academic achievement. These sorts of things will affect how we ask questions, what type of topics we feel comfortable engaging, engaging that group with on day one. As I said, we may hope we have a better culture, but the reality is we've got to be honest with ourselves, be pragmatic in terms of what's really going to engage people. That's going to set us up for a much more sustainable approach and allow us to stretch the organization when we feel we need to, as opposed to going super adventurous early on. There's a whole range of things that we can affect. We picked up for today. We thought about positioning, what to call the program, how we actually present it, what we ask it, people to think about when, they, when, when we give it a brand. What is it that comes into people's mind? Is it pure innovation or is it something else? We thought about communications a little bit. What kind of channels should we use? If we have we initiative overload, maybe we need to think about different opportunities to get the message out there. Try and be different if the existing channels that companies use for new initiative doesn't work. But if they are working, try and complement that. It, it, it's common sense. Think very carefully about those topics, what kind of uh, types of questions might we ask people to get involved with. But try to start building belief and confidence in the process before you even start. So when we ask the question, tell people what the next step is going to be build that into the question. Once we've got these ideas, this is what we're going to do. Make sure you've got credible sponsors there and then follow up. And remember the active moderation role, not every company can do it of course, we always have the capacity. But if we can apply some time and, and, and energy to that, that's going to kind of build people's confidence and belief. There's nothing so, so, much, so much more interesting as seeing people building and improving on your idea and making it stronger. That really makes you want to, makes you want to care, it makes you want to share the, um, the process with other people, and we begin to get more of a viral enthusiasm for the, for the, for the approach. Um, good, so I think we'll, in the purposes of time, we'll leave it there. So um, thank you to Mitch. I would like um, just to uh, take a quick breather as we, uh, we pull up the questions that we, we have there, and um, I'm going to pull those out. So feel free, as you, um, as you see fit, to, uh, to throw out some questions to us. And um, we will try as uh, best I can to, uh, to answer anything that we, uh, we see. So, um, okay, so some good questions already have been submitted. Um, and um, I'm going to go through those as, as, as we progress. So um, one question here we have is around cultural differences and uh, people that are coming from different parts of the world and how to adapt to that. Um, I, you know, I think that's a, it's a good question. And we see this a lot for multinational companies where perhaps they're based in Europe and they have a, an offshore, offshore um, arm or they have a, a division in a different country and they want everybody to start talking to each other. Um, what I would say is that your intuition is usually right with regard to how people collaborate and share. Um, bear it in mind when it comes to asking questions and think about how you can create a question that's going to be appropriate to both communities. Sometimes organizations will um, ask a question that's worded in a particular way and then reverse it, invert it for the alternative culture. So actually run two parallel questions for different, for different communities and steer it towards the things that make them strong. The danger, of course, with that is that people tend to, um, you tend, you're then doubling up on your work and people aren't necessarily collaborating so well. So what we normally say is, is go after the more, um, adapt to the more conservative, um, pragmatic culture 
and um, the uh, the more adventurous one will look after itself. So deal with the, with the sort of lowest common denominator, and um, you know you've got to look at this combination. So the Gert Hofstadt stuff is quite helpful in that. Take a look at it or talk to us, and we'll be able to to guide you towards what sort of techniques may be may be relevant. Okay, let's look at some other questions here. Um, so examples of good first campaign topics. Yeah, it's a good question. So the sort of things that companies will typically do is they'll go after things like process innovation. So how do we make something 5%, 10% faster? The process innovation is one of those areas that's really good for a first campaign topic because, of course, usually you can measure the value of the improvement that you make. So if we make something 5% better, we can work out how much that costs us in terms of people and other, other, other associated costs. Maybe we can't necessarily realize that, but we can certainly measure it. We make something 5% faster, that creates at least an efficiency saving which we can communicate. So process innovation, making stuff faster is a good topic we, we often see. Um, other topics we see is to look at an established um, program that's not necessarily performing too well and see if there's anything we can do to help. So bringing a diversity of opinions. So perhaps we have an established product that's um, not as profitable as we would like, and we look at how we might be able to make that product a little bit cheaper. So how can we improve um, the amount of uh, money we make on it, but without impinging on the quality? Often once a product's out there in market, it's not something that's necessarily addressed in great detail in terms of optimization and making sure it's as good as it possibly can be. So sometimes when it's three years into its maturity cycle, looking at what it costs, seeing if we can make it, and now for a little bit cheaper, materials will change, that's another good topic. So um, two good examples there, I would say process innovation is a good one, making something a little faster, and secondly, looking at an established product to make it, seeing if you can make it a little bit cheaper, essentially a different version of cost savings, but the helping with the profitability of the, of, of the campaign. Um, what other words other than innovation are more of a catch? Well, it's not that innovation isn't a catch, it's a question of is it appropriate to your culture. You saw a couple of brands there from our, from our clients and neither of them used the, the innovation tagline. We tend to see companies that use t t terms that are sort of synonymous with things like collaboration, with engagement, with connecting with people, with hubs. Um, those sorts of um, with those sorts of words are words that we, we typically use. Um, you think about what we're actually asking people to do: it's sharing and collaborating. And those sorts of uh, that sort of terminology, I think, is, is just fine. So it's just a question of making sure we don't switch off the people that are particularly uh, interested in you know, innovation. Um, okay, let's look at other questions we have here. Um, how do you deal with people? getting tired after several challenges and saying, here we go again, your participation declines, yeah. So this certainly will occur um, from time to time. And usually it occurs because we're asking the same types of questions to the same audience over and over again. So what we need to be looking for is more diversity in terms of the topics that we ask. So different types of topic, if we're going to ask the same audience, or different types of audiences with similar questions. You can imagine that the most important thing for your company is cost savings and you bombard them with question after question on cost saves, it's unsurprising that people run out of ideas on that topic and simply start disengaging. So diversity of topics is important, but also diversity of the sort of techniques. So if we run a, an innovation campaign one week, maybe we want to think about one of our best practices the next week. Maybe the following week we look at risk. Think about all the different types of areas where we can add value. Developing more of a portfolio of different innovation topics is going to be um, helpful and then phase those topics um, based on what you've done historically. So if we're going to be addressing the same audience each time, try to get that diversity up there. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. Um, how successful are incentives to increase levels of participation? Who are the best financial, dinner with the CEO, awards, etc.? So um, incentives are an area of sort of, I think, reasonable controversy. Um, in our experience, Actually, offering a reward to incentivize participation doesn't work so well. Um, we find that actually, if we can build people's confidence and belief in the process up, that this is valuable, that it's helpful, that it's constructive to the organization, but we don't necessarily need to offer rewards as such. That's not to say you shouldn't reward people, but offering the reward in itself doesn't necessarily develop a sustainable and effective participation. So what we tend to find is the process of innovation points, accruing points, based on good behavior, so joining in regularly, sharing, collaborating, and then actually having more points, greater levels of points for, for offering things of greater quality.
So we don't necessarily just reward people who are busy, we reward primarily those people who are offering high levels of quality. And at the end of the year, maybe you cash your points in for something that's valuable to you. So in terms of maybe, to, to use the examples in the question, maybe dinner with the CEO is one option, but another option is an extra day off or a, fam a day out with the family. Trying to second guess what's going to motivate people is always dangerous changes through the day, it changes depending on your circumstances, the role that you have. So if you're going to offer rewards, and, I, and, and I think about rewards in recognition, as in recognition terms as opposed to a motivating term, try to give people a range of flexible options that they can choose and cash in some of, the, some of their points for doing so, a little bit like air miles. We think that works quite well. But bear in mind your culture as well. Um, some cultures um, like the Middle East will typically need incentives to join in. Others like you know, Western Europe, North America will typically not need incentives if they're knowledge workers. So unfortunately we're now up to time. I did notice there are a number of questions we haven't had a chance to get to, so we'll try and come back to you um, uh, over email to respond to those. And uh, hopefully that's, uh, that's helpful to you. So it just leaves me to, to thank everybody for joining in and thank you Mitch for, for hosting and, and, and supporting us today. And I uh, look forward to having you join us next time.